All right, everybody, it's 3 o'clock. Uh, welcome to the this month's interoperability, ESIP interoperability and technology tech dive talk. And I'm Rich Signal from the USGS. I am the co-chair of the Information and Technology and Interoperability Committee with Ethan Davis from Unidata. And as we're going to start this call, as we always do, just showing you that this is the inter interoperability and technology page at ESIP. There's a mailing list here you can click and join so you'll be notified of these events if you happen to have gotten the forward from somebody else. And here the, on the activities button, if you click here, you will see a list of all of our Tech Dive webinars that we've had in the past. Each one of them has a recording. Usually we have slides. Um, and you can see upcoming talks. Um, we're having a little mini, mini tile uh, talk session here. <laughs> Today we've got um, Todd Smith from AGI and next month we're going to have Sam Matthews from Mathbox. So if you click into this you can see a little bit more about the, each talk and as I mentioned Todd is going to tell us today about 3D tiles um, and he's a uh, CZM project product manager who's been working with this with the AGI team on CZM for uh, quite a while and he's a Penn State Penn, Penn State grad which is my hometown was was the town I was born in so all right I'm gonna let you take it away Todd um, I'm gonna make you the presenter and let's see here and you should be able to share your screen looking good all right, let me go into slideshow mode here. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Rich. And also, just to thank you to the group here for uh, having me uh, give this presentation. Uh, this is awesome that I'm able to uh, describe some of the work that we're doing. And uh, uh, yeah, just thank you so much for allowing us to be able to uh, present here. I guess yeah, just a little bit about me. I am the product manager for Cesium. Uh, so uh, I am with the one who's the main uh, user interface uh, to, to, to Cesium. So I do a lot of uh, user interactions to be able to uh, boil down a lot of the use cases into uh, features and uh, capabilities for Cesium. Uh, so unfortunately, I am not the technical expert on 3D tiles. I do have a good understanding of what 3D tiles are. But uh, unfortunately, uh, our development team was not able to join us today. So I should be able to answer most of your questions uh, that you have about um, cesium and, and also 3D tiles. But if you do have any uh, really deep uh, technical questions, that we may have to take that offline and we may have to uh, bring in some additional resources uh, sometime after the meeting in order to answer those. So anyway, yeah, so thank, thank you very much uh, for having me today. So today I'm, I'm presenting on a uh, emerging format uh, that we are uh, helping to develop called 3D tiles. And 3D tiles is, as the screen says here, it's an open specification for streaming massive 3D geospatial scenes. And uh, so the the, uh, the whole point of that, this is that uh, we started a open source project about five years ago called Cesium. Uh, some of you may be pretty familiar with Cesium. Uh, if not, just one slide background here is that uh, Cesium is an open source uh, JavaScript library. It has an Apache uh, 2.0 license, and it's uh, mainly used to create uh, 3D glo uh, globes and, and maps. Uh, it is built with browser-based technology, so as such, it can run almost anywhere, whether it be an iPad or an Android device or a laptop or what have you. Uh, however, it, it's, it's not magic, so it does require a technology called WebGL, and it does require a video card in order to, to run the 3D scenes. Um, Cesium is getting lots of global adoption. Uh, we, there's millions of end users across all kinds of different industries. Uh, as a capability here, we started off in the aerospace domain uh, looking at aircraft and satellites uh, in 3D space. But uh, since we open sourced it, we've get, been getting viral adoption from many different industries, whether it be uh, commercial real estate, academia, uh, oil and gas, transportation. Lots of folks are, are using Cesium, which is, which is great. And as uh, just a couple numbers to show the health and status of Cesium, there's uh, over 80 contributors uh, to the Cesium project. And also there's a vibrant forum that you can find at cesiumjs.org uh, where there's over 900 members. So we get tons of uh, questions and we answer that. We try to keep that as healthy and, and going as, as possible. So Cesium provides uh, 3D, 2D, and 2.5D visualization all through one single API. Well, I'll uh, just leave my back. Uh, what's that? 
Uh, I just muted muted everybody again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's it's not just an open source uh, project, but it is a um, it's a highly customizable, flexible API, and we are always focusing on uh, open uh, open standards uh, in in developing cesium. Uh, so that's one of the pieces that we're going to talk about here today is, is some of the uh, new open standards that we're that we're developing. Um, and also, just a, as a quick uh, commercial, is that the cesium is very much focused on time as well. So things that move in space and time, uh, cesium handles really well. And uh, and so we always view time as a first class citizen. So if you if you are new to cesium, I would encourage you to go out to cesiumjs.org and check out many of the demonstrations and presentations that we we have posted out there. So as you can see here, uh, just on the screen, we've got lots of different use cases, whether it be from uh, lidar visualization to uh, being able to show uh, adventure activities, um, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, paragliders over the Alps, or even NASA has done a really cool cesium visualization of asteroids, uh, being able to show them uh, in 3D space. And then uh, the biggest cesium implementation every year is we help uh, NORAD track Santa, uh, which is kind of cool because last year we had over 30 million users uh, in a 24-hour in a period. So lots of different use cases there. So. Let me get into. Um, hey, hey, Todd, just one quick question. That one, that uh, the middle picture on the bottom, is that um, a structure for motion uh, topography? Yeah. So, um, so what what that is is that is a lidar uh, collect, an airborne lidar, lidar collect, that was turned into a DSM, that was then transformed into uh, a streaming service that was then consumed by cesium. Okay. And the uh, the image on the right. That is a uh, ground a ground based uh, lidar uh, collect, um, and that's that's all uh, point cloud uh, visualization, but done done with the same type type of technology. Yeah. Okay. So um, so 3D tiles. When when we started cesium, uh, we really did not want to get involved with formats and standards and specifications. You know, it's one of those things where we were very focused on just the software. And we already and, and uh, five years ago we knew that there was lots of standards out there, and we simply just wanted to leverage those robust standards and just use them uh, inside of cesium. Um, one thing that we noticed is that that strategy had two uh, significant challenges with it. Uh, first of all, the existing standards and techniques for uh, 2D visualization uh, really didn't or does not fit well inside of 3D. So if you think about a, a 2D map. And some of the standards that go with 2D visualization is that you know you have a 2D map and you, you zoom in on an area, and most likely you're hitting some type of um, TMS structured data, where you have a quad tree index of tiles, and as you zoom in, you get more and more uh, resolution. And in a 2D world, that works great because you're always looking at some uh, rectangular area of the world. Uh, but in 3D, when you zoom in and you click on a location and then you bend the globe or you move the camera. Uh, the regular 2D structures don't work as well because in a 3D world you might be looking at the horizon of the earth or you might be looking at the cliff of, of a mountain or a mountain peak and next thing you know you're pulling tiles from 500 kilometers away and that sometimes becomes very uh, expensive on the on the rendering. So in, in some cases the 2D uh, uh, formats work okay inside of cesium but we quickly learned that uh, to do massive 3D streaming, um, the, re the, the existing 2D standards for data visualization just did not cut it. And the second thing is that a lot of the existing 3D standards that are out there for, uh, yeah, for the 3D world were all about data interoperability and storage and not necessarily streaming of the, of the data for visualization. So that, that caused a really difficult problem in that in order to render objects inside of 3D, you mainly had to do a really significant download into the, into the, into the application, into the engine. And that obviously caused huge challenges as well. So in order to uh, address those two issues, that we created a spec called 3D Tiles. And this open spec is focused on streaming massive amounts of heterogeneous uh, 3D data sets uh, over the web. And uh, so that's where uh, that's where we are today. And uh, with heterogeneous, you know, we have many different types of 3D data out there, whether it be a 3D model or terrain data, or even like things like uh, models of trees or furniture or uh, 3D buildings is another good example. 
uh, LiDAR. Uh, so that's, there's, there's lots of different 3D different types, but we wanted a way to uh, stream them in one uh, format so that we could have a common interface to that data inside of Cesium. So once, uh, once we have that 3D uh, view, we really wanted to make sure that it was more than just a pretty picture. Uh, there's lots of consumer grade uh, visualizations out there that are, you know, really good, uh, really good uh, pretty pictures. But a lot of our users inside of Cesium want a whole lot more than just a pretty picture. They want to do something with the data. So that's where being able to identify uh, heights of buildings or identify attributes of the data or be, be able to filter the data. Or like from a uh, commercial real estate example, they wanted, uh, people want to be able to say, show me all of the office buildings in this city that I have tenants where they're going, where their leases are going to be expiring in the next months. Um, so to be able to take that data, uh, query the attributes, and then be able to style it so that they can quickly uh, see results of the data, that's the one uh, driving piece that we wanted to make sure that was supported inside of uh, 3D tiles. We wanted it to be a whole lot more than just a, a pretty picture. Uh, so that's where, you know, being able to look at zoning or restrictions or en energy usage, uh, these are all important pieces of it. So the way this works is inside of the 3D tile, we have the ability to embed attributes of the data or embed primary keys of the data that on the click event, you could go out and query another uh, database to be able to bring that data in. So as you're looking at this animated GIF here, you're, you're able to see all the different uh, items inside of the uh, 3D tile set that I'm showing you here of Manhattan to be able to sh uh, show those those things in in real time. Hey Todd, you might get into this, but does does this include time uh, specification? Like, can these things change in time? I <laughs> that's a great question, Rich, and I I, I will get into that. Uh, yeah. So currently, if you did have an attribute of time in your data that is supported inside of 3D tiles, however, uh, just simply looking at the attribute of the data is going to be insufficient, so I, I will get into some of our roadmap on where we're, where we're going with that. Okay, thanks. So um, it's more than just a pretty picture, but then also we wanted to have um, unified styling. So we talked about the heterogeneousness of 3D data, whether it be from a point cloud or a tree or a building. Uh, we wanted to have one unified way to style that data. So in this example, you're seeing some atmos atmospheric data and being able to do per point properties inside of each one of those objects, we have developed a, a JSON uh, uh, tiling, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, styling scheme to be able to define uh, color or define uh, the hide or show uh, property or even transparency. So if you're looking at RGB or temperature or even things like uh, chemical, chemical composition um, that's in the attribute data, this can all be fed into the declarative styling system that we have developed uh, with 3D tiles. So it really makes it uh, really performant and also very customizable to be able to meet your needs on once you, once you uh, create that 3D tile on how you want it to be displayed. And the nice thing is it, is it is all unified, so whether you're looking at one type of data or another, it is a common styling, uh, styling uh, uh, system. Um, so also inside of Cesium, uh, most of the styling is done on a graphics card, and as such, it makes the styling ex extremely fast. So that's where uh, updates to this data uh, can be done really, really fast on the client. Uh, so that's a one, another good, good piece of this. So to give you a little bit of a, a background on this, uh, one piece that I, I do want to touch on that is important is that um, 3D tiles is not the first uh, format that we've, we've created here on the Cesium team. Uh, we've been working fairly close with a group called Kronos, and you can think of Kronos as the uh, OGC of the 3D graphics world. Uh, so Kronos does a lot of work within um, uh, get the game industry and also the 3D graphics world, so they've created things like OpenGL, WebGL, uh, Kalata. Those might be terms that you may have heard. and um, so that's where uh, we've been working with Kronos, and a, a little bit ago, we helped them um, define a specification called GLTF. And you can think of GLTF as a web version of Kalata. So if you have one 3D model, like one tree, or one building, or uh, one uh, aircraft model, you can represent that inside of GLTF. 
And there's lots of people using GLTF right now. Uh, you can see on the screen here uh, the many different uh, companies, organizations that have publicly stated their support for GLTF, and this is something that's 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 going forward uh, even a lot faster now. Even more and more folks are getting involved with, with uh, GLTF. But the the important piece of this is that 3D tiles, that's spe our specification, is norm normatively references the GLTF format. So if you think about uh, the payload inside of the 3D tile, lots of that is is represented by the uh, GLTF format. So um, out there, there's lots of, of open source. Uh, importers or exporters, converters, pipelines, validators, loaders for G for GLTF, and that's where it's good to have that background of, of what GLTF is in order to better understand uh, 3D tiles. So, with regard to uh, standards organization, we are working with the with the OGC. So, we have entered the OGC community standard process. Um, this is a really cool achievement because what that tells us is that. There was lots of folks out there using 3D tiles even before the specification has been even ratified. Um, we just got started on that uh, standards process. We did uh, reach quorum back in September uh, to be able to start that standardization process of 3D tiles, which is uh, yeah, we're super excited about. Uh, but, that, but the cool thing is since we were able to go through the community standards process because lots of people have already been, been using it. Um, which is which really validated our opinion of the need for this standard to be st stood up, um, and the submission team. You, you can see the organizations that are represented there. Uh, we do have a nice cross section of government, commercial, research, and uh, academia, all involved with the uh, this community standard. So, as um, as as I move forward here, I know that's a, that's a lot of. Uh, background information and a good, uh, hopefully a good description of what 3D tiles, what that format is. Um, and what I'd like to do now is just take a couple selected examples of 3D tiles because hopefully the visualization aspect of this will help you better understand uh, the impact of, of 3D tiles and how people are using it. So, so, so for this next part of the talk, I was hoping to go over some showcase and uh, showcases from various companies and groups that are working uh, with 3D tiles. So. <laughs> First, and I hope, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just—I was just going to say, um, of course, you know, over web, uh, over GoToMedia, it might not be. Uh, is this going to be live? Uh, well, anyway, the performance might be, not be quite what <laughs> it would be if we were looking at these on our own, you know, on our own browsers. No worries. Yeah, no worries. What I what I plan on doing is uh, showing ma mainly screenshots. Uh, I was hoping to show uh, at least one demonstration, and I promise I will move the camera really slow in order to make <laughs> back over okay. the web. Yeah, good. good. That's the, what I was trying to say, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the first example here um, are some folks uh, in Switzerland. So it's the uh, Federal Office of uh, Topography, uh, uh, generally known as Swiss Topo. Uh, they have uh, baselined one cesium, and also they are implementing uh, 3D tiles uh, as we speak. And the uh, the cool piece here is they have lots and lots of geospatial data, and they have developed a uh, internet-based web portal to be able to showcase that data and show off that data. And lots of it is in 3D. They've got some awesome terrain in Switzerland. And uh, they wanted to be able to show off, they've got about 1.5 million buildings. And they've processed that into 3D tiles and they've clamped it to their terrain. And so uh, you can you can definitely see uh, lots of great uh, 3D buildings on top of the terrain. And they're able to stylize uh, those buildings to be able to show off some of the attributes that they have inside of, of many of their 3D objects whether it be uh, solar potential or types of, uh, of buildings, they're able to quickly uh, represent those inside of, of cesium. Uh, the total size of their data was about 20, uh, 22 gig, and their data was formatted uh, in Colada. And uh, so we were able to help them uh, take that data, uh, process that into 3D tiles, and then, and then push that all out on uh, their Amazon stack to be able to uh, show that off to the web. Uh, is, is, that a, is that open to the public, or is that a private thing? Yeah, so so they are. Uh, it is a is a public web portal, and they are looking to go live with that um, in the coming months. So yeah, uh, keep a keep an eye out on social media because uh, I know that they do want to advertise that once they are ready to go. Okay. Um, the next next uh, uh, demonstration here is the is the one that I showed earlier of the city of New York. Um, what we did here is uh, we uh, actually had two pipelines of data, and we we did this purposefully uh, because we obviously wanted to have more 
uh, familiarity with the data uh, so that we could build a better pipeline. So we did. We took the uh, the native data from the from the city of New York, which is in city GML, and we processed that into Colada. And then we once we had it in Colada, we turned it into 3D tiles. But then also um, the folks at MapZen had have done a really cool uh, extract from uh, the OpenStreetMap data, and we converted that into the into Colada, and then we converted that to uh, 3D tiles as well. And that was about uh, 1.1 million buildings, and we did this at a code sprint. So it took over a weekend for us to, to push this through. Lots of lots of data, but the the building data is awesome. There's lots of good uh, density, but then also a lot of definition with the uh, with the buildings as well. And the, uh, the the nice thing here is that we were able to do the dynamic styling and also um, you know put imagery layers in there as well. The total size of the source data was about 12 12 gig of of city GML, and just to take a quick look at uh, what this looks like, if I bring up my browser here, you can see as I zoom through the city, we're able to mouse over each building, and then get the uh, attributes of that of that building by simply clicking on it or mousing over. And the one thing that you'll notice as I slowly zoom out here is the level of detail that's found inside of 3D tiles is very apparent. So when we process this uh, this tile set. Uh, the size of the building was the most important feature uh, that we defined in the processing. So as the level of detail uh, is, is, uh, is, is seen here, as we zoom out, the range uh, of the object to the camera in a regular quad tree index of data is that usually the furthest object away will fall off. But you can see here some of the smaller buildings inside of Manhattan are falling off to be able to, uh, to make the scene more performant. And even the, uh, some of the buildings that are really large but further away in the distance are still viewable. And this goes back to the tiling scheme that we have developed to be able to make this much more performant inside of cesium than, uh, than what would normally be found in a regular 2D specification. And then uh, obviously the things uh, that I talked about earlier, such as being able to color by height to be able to show uh, uh, different uh, of the attributes of the data to be able to show them more effectively inside of cesium. So it's a quick example of, of what you're able to do with 3D tiles. I get back to my uh, presentation here. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I've got this open in my uh, other window here, you know, and it's just, uh, it's uh, the performance is amazing. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are super proud of that because there is, uh, if, if you ever get your hands on that, uh, that source data, it's it's very heavy, um, and it's lots and lots of data, uh, lots of lots of uh, in, intricate uh, geometry. So to be able to present that inside of a uh, an open source uh, 3D um, visualization tool inside of a browser without a plugin, uh, yeah, we're, we're we're definitely pretty proud of that. Yeah. Um, yeah the next uh, the next uh, uh, example here is from a open source project called Entwine. Uh, Entwine is all about being able to connect to uh, point cloud data and then convert it into something useful. So the folks at Entwine have built a uh, 3D tile exporter as well. So what you're looking at here is about one point, well, actually, yeah, it's a one point, I'm sorry, 4.7 billion points uh, in New York City post Sandy. And this was collected by uh, your folks at USGS. And it took about two hours of processing on Amazon's, uh, we had, there's a 30 core machine that they had running in order to process this data. But you can see that uh, you are able to then uh, take the data and then be able to present that inside of Cesium. So this is a really good example of just lots and lots and lots of data being streamed over the web. And um, so since we had this data, and since this data is on the web, we wanted to be able to showcase both of the New York data sets together since, you know, since we are continually advertising uh, 3D tiles as being a, uh, a nice way to support heterogeneous data. So what we wanted to do is be able to take our city GML data that we processed and also this uh, this point cloud data and show them together. So here is a screenshot of of the uh, of the point cloud data of Manhattan, and then we took the exact same camera position and we simply replaced it with the city GML, and you can see the uh, the differences there. But then also to be able to show them together, you can see how well they they line up. And that just and that's that's a really cool uh, testament to uh, cesium being able to take uh, different uh, uh, different data sets and be able to stream them together inside of uh, one application. 
so um, another another uh, company uh, uh, called uh, Vricon, they've got some really, really cool tech that's able to take satellite imagery and be able to create uh, localized DSMs out of that satellite imagery. And they have an exporter that uh, pushes uh, 3D tiles to um, uh, it, it out, out from their from their software, so they've built a, a fantastic uh, exporter that takes uh, their high resolution DSM, and then uh, we're able to consume that inside of of Cesium. If, if you want more information about that uh, that capability, uh, we did do a pretty nice blog with Rikon. Uh, so you can go out to cesiumjs.org and look at the blog and search for that uh, that blog post. By DSM, you mean a digital surface model that combines train and, and imagery, or is that, what is that? What's yeah. DSM? So, uh, so with, with terrain, you either have a DSM or a DTM. So uh, a digital terrain model will take all of the bumps over that are like buildings and noise that you may, you may find in your airborne LiDAR and creates a, 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 a terrain model, where a DSM, what that will do, will keep all of those, um, those uh, bumps in the terrain, such as buildings or uh, other items that are found on top of the natural terrain. Oh, I got you. Okay. Um, so uh, here's a uh, just from a just to add a little international flavor here is uh, we have there's a company out there called Virtual City Systems that's uh, doing great work in the smart city um, domain, and they are using uh, 3D tiles to be able to showcase uh, high resolution buildings but also textures of buildings and uh, they have the ability so what they wanted to show is uh, uh, use uh, city land use inside of cities and such so to be able to have uh, the highly highly uh, accurate textured buildings inside of cesium is something that they found valuable so a quick this I think this is the city of Berlin you can zoom in and see what uh, what they've done uh, as well and they, uh, so they uh, being able to uh, take these high resolution buildings and be able to show them over the web uh, is something that uh, yeah, they're definitely very, very proud of. Um, one, yeah, a couple more here. Uh, there's a company out there called Bentley that uh, does a lot of work in the uh, architects, construction, and engineering uh, world. Also the, uh, the BIM world as well. And uh, they, they are a mature software company that has uh, lots and lots of 3D needs, mainly for, like I mentioned, for the engineering community. They do a lot of work with uh, transportation groups as well as uh, construction groups, a uh, very large user base. Uh, they've developed a product called Context Capture, which is able to take uh, photos from uh, GPS tagged images. Uh, so that could be from a drone or from a um, high-resolution ca handheld camera. And based upon those images, they're able to stitch those together and create a unified mesh from those photos. And uh, one option they have for the export of that mesh is 3D tiles. So to be able to take uh, something from uh, capturing the data, the whole way to create a mesh to putting it into a web browser uh, is something that is uh, really a, a amazing. And uh, they're able to do this uh, as a, a reality mesh. So if you're thinking about a construction site that you wanted to be able to get the base uh, level mesh for before you actually start um, messing around with the uh, with the infrastructure. Uh, this is a good a good way to do it. So as a as a quick demonstration, um, I'm using uh, our soon to be released uh, cesiumjs.com platform to be able to show this off. But what we did here in Exton, Pennsylvania, where I'm sitting right now, is that uh, we have a, a Phantom 4 drone here uh, at, in the company. We've got a couple. Uh, Good uh, drone uh, pilots uh, that uh, that were able to fly around our campus. Uh, our building is this one over here, and we took about uh, it was several hundred images that were GPS tagged, and then we ran it through the the Bentley software, the context capture software, to be able to create the mesh, but then also export it as 3D tiles, and then we were able to create this uh, this phenomenal, this very high resolution um, image, all web based uh, or model, I should say all web-based, to be able to uh, present that over the web uh, inside of the Cesium platform so that uh, people, anybody with a, with a browser and a web connection could be able to uh, view this, this data. So hopefully that's coming across uh, good. 
Um, also with, with Bentley, uh, Bentley pr creates a product called MicroStation, which does uh, building modeling and also uh, structure modeling. So if you are uh, building a new factory or a power plant or a bridge, and many times you'll be using MicroStation to create that. And so uh, they are also exporting uh, 3D tiles. Uh, so if you think about uh, very large CAD models, uh, that is able to be exported as 3D tiles. If you think about inter uh, not only exteriors, but also interior buildings as well, so you could be able to walk the rooms and the floors uh, inside of cesium, that's a, yeah, just another phenomenal uh, use case that, that uh, is available. So I guess one, one final, uh, one final uh, uh, showcase here is that uh, there's a company in Australia called uh, Aerometrics, and uh, they are using 3D tiles as well. Uh, they're doing a lot of uh, drone capture as well, and they wanted to be able to show coastal erosion. So what they did is they took a capture in 2014 and also 2015, and they were able to represent that uh, in time in cesium. And so this goes back to your earlier question. Being able to timestamp data is, is, really, is really good. Uh, and so you're able to do discrete uh, viewing of time-based data inside of cesium with 3D tiles today uh, like this. But as you can see, it's a little bit, um, like I mentioned, discrete. We do plan on a fully uh, functioning time-based 3D tile uh, set, and that's kicking off very, very soon. Um, so that if you are a uh, user that is looking at uh, land erosion or change over time or being able to uh, model things in the atmosphere that change quite quickly over time, um, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, being able to have 3D tiles fully support that so that you don't have to uh, hack around uh, like, like these folks with this, with this awesome example. It just, it just took a, a good bit of a hack in order to make that work. So as a, as a full uh, roadmap discussion, uh, so currently uh, from today until the spring, uh, we are putting our final touches on the spec, and we're hoping to get that moved through the OGC community standards process um, you know, by the spring. We're hopefully going to have that uh, ratified. Um, and then also uh, we are finishing the open source CESIM implementation as well as the validator uh, to make sure that people have full confidence that CESIM is able to support all of their 3D tile implementations. And then uh, coming this summer, we're hoping to have the time dynamic 3D tiles uh, fully operational so that we can be able to better support uh, time-based 3D tile uh, implementations. So that's, uh, that's really what I, uh, I have for today. Uh, if, it's a couple resources for you. If you do go out to GitHub, let me go out to my browser here. You can uh, go out to the 3D tile repo that's found in the Analytical Graphics Inc. Um, repository, and this is where you'll find everything uh, 3D tiles from a technical perspective. Uh, so you'll you'll not only see uh, lots of examples and the format and the standards, but also uh, many of the of the demonstrations that I showed you here today are out there as well. And uh, you'll be able to see lots of uh, yeah, demos and also. Uh, resources with regard to like the introduction, the tile met metadata, what does the tile set.json look like, uh, what, how do you do the declarative styling and what that looks like today. So all of this is available as resource for you out on the web, so I'd encourage you to not only take a look at cesiumjs.org, but then also take a look at the uh, 3D tiles repo on GitHub. There's lots and lots of information out there for you. So uh, yeah, so thank you very much. I'd be willing to uh, field any questions uh, that, that you may have so that I can, uh, you know, help you out with any discussions that you may have internally with your, with your group. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, Todd. That was, that was excellent. I, uh, I have a, let's see, so everybody I think is, I think people can unmute themselves. Um, uh, I, everybody is muted, so if you want to ask a question, you, you do uh, unmute yourself. And if you have a problem, please chat me. Um, I've got a question, Tata. Uh, so I don't see, I didn't see Esri on your list of uh, folks who are using this tile specification. Do they have their own 3D uh, tile specification, or are they just not that interested in the 3D, uh, or don't you know? Or no, yeah, great, great question. And uh, the one thing that's cool about the OGC uh, community standards process is that there can be multiple. Uh, standards out there in, in the community, and I know Esri's done a ton of work in 3D, and a lot of their work is awesome, 
and they uh, they have developed their own um, uh, f open format um, that is uh, that they are going to look to go through the the uh, OGC process community process as well. Uh, so we we do hope to collaborate uh, with with uh, Esri to be able to uh, to uh, potentially enhance uh, 3D tiles, but then also uh, it's good to have uh, you know an, another OGC specification out there. That that's what the community process uh, allows. So yep. that's 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 about as as, as much as much as I know. But that's uh, yeah, it's a, potentially a very good thing. Okay, and I got I got one more question, which is just. Uh, you know, you, sh you showed a lot of buildings uh, and stuff, but there's nothing that uh, would prevent people from using these 3D tiles for things like, um, you know, ISO surfaces, which would describe like a jet stream or a Gulf Stream or hypoxic conditions in, you know, in some ocean or some, you know, how, could, how well do you do below the surface too? Could you use this for like earthquake and geophysical data or, um, you know, sort of those sort of scientific areas that a lot of folks on the phone are probably... Uh, interested in? <laughs> That's a great question, and I expect once people start uh, um, even using 3D tiles even more than they already are, there's going to be lots of uh, unique use cases of 3D tiles that we never even dreamed of. Um, and that's where with, with 3D tiles, really it's a specification to uh, look at uh, 3D data in space and time. So I would imagine that there's going to be lots of folks who are going to be doing all kinds of creative things that we never even dreamed of. So I would think like atmospheric conditions would be a great use of 3D tiles, like for instance, uh, volumetric data that you may have uh, to be able to, to style that uh, in space and time to be able to show off temperature or uh, chemical composition or even uh, jet contrails. Uh, with regard to underground, uh, cesium does handle that today. There are some weird artifacts that do show up, but it is it is uh, capable to go um, uh, to, to visualize things under under surface today. However, we are working to make that a whole lot better. So you can uh, you stay tuned with uh, with the open source project in Cesium to 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 let you know when that's going to happen. But being able to show uh, things uh, completely under the surface, like at a tectonic level, uh, those are things that you know, we have had lots of use cases for, and uh, we are working to, to that would be an awesome use case of 3D tiles. Um, it'd be great to have your folks take a look at it to see whether they have any. Um, uh, comment or critique about the spec in order to, to better to better uh, uh, handle uh, use cases like that. Um, I don't see a reason why that would be inhibited from a data perspective, from a visualiza visualization perspective. There may be some things that we may need to take care of on the uh, cesium side in order to better handle the camera control to go underground and be able to peel back layers and such. Uh, but as far as the data goes, I, I don't see why that would not be a, a, a problem there. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, also, open it up for other uh, folks to ask questions. I see we have 25 people on the line. I hope I hope nobody's. I hope this isn't just because I've muted everybody so that they can't respond. <laughs> uh, Again, chat me if you want to ask a question and you're being technically challenged for some reason. Um, I guess, Todd, I had, I had one more question. Um, it seems like if we're delivering scientific data like to the browser, like we deal with a lot of, um, well, uh, in our group anyway, we deal with a lot of like four or five dimensional uh, data, you know, that's being produced by atmospheric models or oceanic models or, or hydrologic models. and um, you know, we, we we deliver imagery to the browser, uh, you know, maps of things at different times and levels and things like that. And then, and we were thinking about uh, ways of delivering the actual data values along with their geospatial positions so that they could be, so that they could be used in the browser. But it seems to me that this 3D tile is kind of an interesting, somewhere in the middle in a way of, in terms of, like, you could deliver more scientific information than you could through imagery and allow it to be styled in the browser, but without delivering, you know, the full uh, scientific data, which, as you pointed out, would be um, also kind of difficult to do efficiently with your, you know, the curving uh, earth and everything. Um, is that is that a reasonable description, or do you have a different take on that? or? So that's 
No, you're, you, I, I, I think your, your mind is, is right on with regard to uh, the general philosophy behind 3D tiles, is that uh, being able to visualize 3D data, uh, you know, is, is just a, a difficult thing to start with, but then to be able to have lots of different types of data, but then being able to stream that all into one common interface and styled through one common interface, it's a, it's a pretty big challenge. So if you have data at, at time, but then you also have magnitude associated with, with that, that, that payload, uh, to be able to declaratively style that, uh, you know, could, could potentially be a very, very big download into the browser, which you obviously wouldn't want. So that's, what, that's the general philosophy behind 3D tiles, to be able to solve that problem. And to be able to have that uh, streamed over the web so that you can get that level of detail to be able to, to only be able to visualize the things that you want to visualize uh, and then be able to uh, have lots and lots and lots of data available to you, but not all uh, downloaded at one time so that you can get that uh, streaming capability as you uh, move around the, uh, the scene uh, is, 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 is very effective. And that's, that's what, that, those are the things that we are solving today uh, with with three D tiles, um, so that so, so being able to have that uh, X Y Z T uh, plus magnitude uh, to be able to have you know those five dimensional type things where you can be able to have the attribute data either in the tile itself or be able to be queried from to, to an external uh, service or, or model. Uh, that is something that yeah that is something that three D tiles uh, you know does does support. So that's uh, that would it would be it would be interesting to see what uh, you know the types of data and models that you do have uh, to see how 3D model, uh, 3D uh, 3D tiles could support that whether it be you know very large atmospheric uh, models or even uh, you know some 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 ground based or oceanic models um, it'd be yeah, it'd be very interesting to see that the processing of that as well as the visualization of that uh, could become very interesting because then not everybody would need to have a a fat client uh, piece of software in order to do the visualization of of the uh, of the data. I guess one one piece here is that you know we with 3D tiles and with cesium, we really consider ourselves uh, kind of the the YouTube of 3D geospatial, so that uh, you know you have somebody who creates the model, processes the model, and then uploads it out to the web so that it can be visualized by by the masses. Um, same thing with with YouTube. You have you know, very large volumes of video data that is then, uh, that's very, very heavy. And they, the cool thing about YouTube is they've created that transport stream to make it, you know, very uh, effective streaming. And uh, you know, we're looking at, at, C, at, at 3D tiles plus cesium to be able to do the same type of thing with 3D data. Cool, thank you. I, there's a chat question that it says, it's, it's asking about, um, are there any application examples so far that have um, done anything with oil spills or chemicals, you know, kind of like, yeah, m things moving around in, uh, you know, in a 3D hydrodynamic model or atmospheric model. Um. Yeah, um, there is one that I'm aware of. Uh, again, being an open source project, we're really beholden to what people share with us. Um, so if you go to cesiumjs.org and go to the demos page, uh, there is one out here that I did see that was kind of cool to be able to show um, atmospheric data. Uh, here's one that's showing um, geothermal subsurface visualization. Uh, I think the uh, I think this came out of the University of Oklahoma. I think that might be one that we may want to take a look at also. Um, oh, there's a US, yeah. Is there one out there for? Oh, virtual virtual NASA storm. Yeah, there you go, Typhoon. Which, that one? What was, yeah, what was that one? Uh, uh, we have too many demos. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, uh, it, it is. There it is yeah, go ahead. There was something, there was a typhoon. Uh, I don't know. But actually, that raises an interesting question because I think, like, we've used some, we use, like, uh, um, what, what do you call your uh, CZM mark, uh, CZML. We CZML. Use, yeah, we use CZML for doing particle trajectories, but that's not, that's something different than, that's, like, rendering objects in 3D space and in time, right? And 
And um, it's a little bit, I guess that's kind of interesting. It's a little bit of a, that's a contrasting approach, right? Actually deliver the actual object to the browser. That's right. Yeah, and, 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 and CZML, that's, that's not uh, the, the, the topic of choice today, but uh, CZML is another open format that we've developed uh, for uh, visualizing obje uh, vector data in space and time. So CZML is a, is, is a really good uh, vector uh, format to be able to do those things that you just described there. Uh, the one limitation with CZML is that, you know, if you wanted to do like volumetric items or if you wanted to be able to uh, stream it, uh, that's where 3D tiles is, is might be a consideration. And, you know, it, there may come a, a time where we can, with, with, with 3D tiles, it's very extensible. So the once you start looking at the spec and inside of GitHub, uh, the payload of 3D tiles can really be defined as whatever you want. So there may come a time where CZML is actually embedded as a as a payload inside of 3D tiles. So anyway, so that's a long-winded answer to say, yeah, that it's um, there. There are uh, yeah, lots of good use cases out here of of what you could potentially do. So what have you got showing there? Yeah, this is the, this is the uh, Typhoon one from the folks at NASA. So All right. Is it what is that a bunch of arrows? Uh, I think this is, uh, what is this? This is, um, it's definitely METOC data. I, I, it looks like it's GRIB data. So it might be, uh, you know, GRIB data is a cube of data that, that defines objects inside the atmosphere. So it looks, what they, it looks like what they did is they, they interrogated the GRIB file and then they were able to attribute uh, each point associated with, uh, is that pressure? Are those vectors? I can't even, I can't tell. Anyway, um, I think I, yeah, I think I see what you're, so that's being delivered through 3D tiles? Uh, good question. I, I, I don't think that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that it is. It, yeah. yeah, I don't think so, actually. But okay. um, there's another good question that um, is in cesium, what if you have something that's got very, small changes in like some vertical relief. I mean, I think it's really a question saying, can you change the vertical exaggeration so that you can bring out detail where it's, you know, important, you know, like ch small changes in a wetland or, um, or intertidal area or something like that. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so, so in, w w with cesium, there is a vertical exaggeration property that you can set in order to exaggerate the, uh, the terrain to be able to do exactly what you said there. Uh, in, interesting uh, anecdote about that is that uh, we got our hands on uh, I think it was Denmark I think Denmark released 10 meter terrain and it's surprising to see how flat it is <laughs> so in order to make uh, it, it more uh, visually appealing we did exaggerate that data quite a bit uh, so that's where yeah, you are able to, to do that uh, one thing with cesium is that the higher resolution the, the terrain or objects that you're putting into the browser the more impressive it is we do handle you know, very high resolution. We have the ability to handle very high resolution uh, data. Well. Yeah. Are are there tools to help people who may be wanting to provide these three D tiles? Like, are there like Java, you know, um, Python libraries and stuff for you know that would allow people to say convert. Um, scientific data that may, like, like for instance, this weather data. You can imagine that that's stored in, like you said, in GRIB files or HDF or NetCDF files or something. And then you want to create a 3D tile to deliver to 3D, 3D tiles to deliver to the browser. How did do, how does somebody do that? All right. Yeah. So there are. Um, so right now, what where we're at is we have developed uh, Cesium and also the open specification of 3D tiles. Uh, AGI does have. Uh, a number of uh, 3D tile converters that we are working on as a as a product, and these are obviously convenience products for you uh, to be able to maybe help you to get to your goal a whole lot faster. But then we do realize that you know our converters may not be useful to every different industry, so that's where um, there are other companies out there that are de developing uh, 3D tile uh, processors. Um, offhand, I don't know that anybody. I, I, I don't know uh, of, 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 of a company or entity that has already created uh, 3D tile processors for atmospheric data. Uh, not to say that it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, I'm just not, not aware of that. But it is a, you know, it, it does create a market for those type of things, either for, for yourselves to, to develop those processors uh, to create 3D tiles or to work with um, a company 
to be able to to help you out with that as well. That'd be a cool Google Summer of Code project, maybe. <laughs> hey, right. um, anybody else? Um, Uh, yeah, this is this is Mike McCann. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Um, yeah, you mentioned the um, OGC standardization process and also the GitHub repository. Uh, do you have a preferred um, mechanism to receive comments on the spec? Uh, yeah, so there is. Um, so if if you were looking for an informal way to do that. Uh, inside the GitHub repo, you can you, you can submit an issue uh, to be able to uh, get comments on that. Um, also, again, I'm I, I'm talking a little bit out of turn here, but with the OGC spec, if you are an OGC member, uh, there is an avenue. I think there's an avenue that the OGC provides to be able to, to provide commentary on the specification. So um, those are the two main mechanisms that you could use. The first one, I'm, I'm much more uh, sure of than the second one. And, and another question, you, you demoed some really, really impressive um, demos of the 3D tiles in Cesium. Is there another client that uses 3D tiles that you can point us to? Uh, I, not offhand. I am not to say it doesn't exist, but I know that uh, it, Cesium is, is the primary client for 3D tiles. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but but I, C I Cesium is... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to, I mean, Cesium is open, uh, is free and open source, right? That's correct. And I, but that's a, that's a great point. I, I, I do fully expect as uh, 3D tiles gets uh, bigger than it already is uh, and more and more adopted, I would expect uh, many, many clients to, to start adopting 3D tiles. Okay. Uh, fellow Mom, did you have a uh, question? I think there was another question. Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, uh, tell you that there is a question on the chat board from Tanya Haddad on something to do with the limitation vertical scale, and I'm most interested in what the answer would be. Oh, yeah, I think we just talked about that, that you can change the vertical exaggeration. And there are no limitations to it. Um, I'm sure there, yeah, there, there, are, uh, yeah, there are limitations, uh, but as far as... Uh, what you're looking to do, I, I think it does meet your requirement of being able to exaggerate the vertical uh, piece of the uh, of the data. Oh, well, maybe the question is, I mean, I remember like in Google Earth or something, you could only do like three uh, or ten or something. I forget what it was, but you could only, there was a maximum amount that you could do the vertical exaggeration. Maybe that's the question. Does that exist in Cesium? You know what? I don't know. I don't know, but I can I can let me write that down and make and I can get, get back to you on that. Idea. Maybe I, I could say the question another way. Um, it, in an area where um, very small differences in height make a, are, are very important, um, I just was imagining that Cesium is doing a lot of simplification when it renders. Uh, so I wonder if the simplification in, interferes with being able to see those things. And I guess vertical exaggeration is the way to get around that. But um, if that helps you understand the question better, it does. Maybe it, maybe it changes the answer. I don't know. No, yeah, no, that 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 definitely definitely helps me out because yeah, you're right. Um, you know, w w when we do um, visualize a mesh, obviously there is interpolation between the two nodes in order to uh, optimi optimize the the representation of it. So there is there's always error associated with uh, with each rendering, um, and you're right. Vertical exaggeration could be kind of a brute force method to identify those changes in those items. Um, yeah, but let me get you a better answer than what I'm going to be able to provide. That's that's a, that's a, that's a great question with regard to low-level rendering techniques because you need to be able to see uh, very low-level changes in the uh, Z value of data. And uh, you know, one way to yeah, do that. Exactly. What, yeah, exactly. One, one way to do that would be to exaggerate, but I'm, maybe there's a better way to do that. And I'd have to talk to one of our... Uh, uh, core developers to talk about how that actually gets pushed out. So I, I have it on my list here. Rich, I'll, I, I will get that answer back to you. Okay.
anybody else? All right, well, um, Todd, thank you very much. We have recorded this talk, so we will um, probably tomorrow it will be available up on our on the ESIP YouTube channel. And, um, uh, and next time, just also, we're going to continue talking about tiles um, in December with our monthly talk. It's the second Thursday of every month, and we're going to hear from Mapbox on, uh, on vector tiles. So thanks again, Todd. That was great. And um, yeah, you, 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 you knew you knew as much you knew a lot of the technical stuff that we needed to know about. So that was that worked out great. <laughs> hey, All right, yeah. have a great okay. day. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.